we'll sort of talk that this you know, could be one of the best wide receiver classes that this school has ever landed. You were a part of that history. When you take a look at it and evaluate what you got today, how good is it? Well, one, it's a, it's a group effort. I mean, what Coach Pantone and his staff does in this building is uh, tremendous. Uh, you know, I think, and obviously with the help I get in the room uh, with uh, Coach Keenan Bailey is just phenomenal. And, uh, again, the list goes on. I mean, it's not just a two-person operation, not a three-person operation. It's a whole program operation. And, and again, it's, not, it's, it's a lot about what we do, but it's more about them. You know, I mean, they are the right guys. And, and uh, again, people have made comments about you're going kind of out there to get this guy, going over there to get that guy. It's, I really feel like the guys bring us to them. You know, we, we're a good fit. Uh, I like the family environment. They're great players, and, and they have the right makeup, you know, between the ears. And that's the biggest thing I like to look for. Uh, you know, I think that unleashes what any ability you have um, is all predicated on, you know, what you have between the years. And all these guys are great young men, and, and I think they have that makeup. With the, with the guys that you're losing, how much urg urgency is there now to transition from the recruiting phase to get them ready to potentially help next year? Yeah, really important. I mean, that's how they'd want it too. So, but like you, you, like you commented on, I mean, having, you know, seven guys leave in two years, I mean, that's a, that's a large uptake, you know, on taking. And I think that, uh, you know, with that, there's a lot of responsibility, uh, both from the guys that are having opportunities currently in the room and the guys coming in. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities all over the world and all over the, all over the place, I'm sorry. And uh, um, I think our receiver room is definitely one of them. Uh, but again, uh, all of this stuff is on potential. These guys have the makeup. They want to come in and compete, and I know they're going to do that. And I think that we're going to provide them with, with as many resources as possible to be successful. Uh, but, again, this is just kind of like a checkpoint. You know, it's like, it's like Mario Kart. You know, you got, we got the race started good. You know, we hit the first checkpoint just to get to the next checkpoint. So we'll keep pushing. Uh, but this is just the beginning. Brian, of the four guys you brought in today, which positions do you see each of them fitting into this offense at? You know, you kind of you kind of want to play that. You know, where will each guy play? You know, I've talked to them about that. Uh, but you know, we really like guys that are very versatile. You know, and can play different different things. I mean, I think that you know, I, I think of like a Mookie Cooper. I think that he is definitely a guy that can play in that slot and be very dynamic. So it's probably where he'll be. The other three guys, I think they're very flexible. I think they can kind of all move around, and and we'll kind of see how it all plays out. You know, I kind of have a game plan in my head, but I kind of want to leave it there and. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Again, a lot of that's uh, based on the current guys and how they're doing and, and you know, how do we uh, complement what they do with what these guys may do. And, and, again, in the end, there's a lot of work to be put in, and these guys got to learn an offense, and they got to come in and compete and, and really uh, earn the respect of their peers before the rest of it any uh, kind of takes off. KJ leaving and him being the only guy who's really played in the slot this year, do you have to look at whether it's current guys or guys coming in, possibly moving a couple of those guys into the slot to potentially take that role? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that anything's on the table. In the end, you always want your best players on the field, and uh, we'll take a hard look at that uh, as an offense and see where maybe each guy would be most successful. But understand, like, Austin Mack is a great example of a guy that played all three positions, uh, played one position, frankly, his entire career, and then in this last part of his career, his last season, he played the other two. So um, I don't ever like putting handcuffs on anybody and kind of putting them in a box and, and telling them they can only play one position. I feel like these guys that come in here, they're, they're great receivers. They can play any spot, you know, on that, uh, um, on the offense. So uh, we'll adjust week to week. We'll adjust year to year, whatever it takes. So definitely take a good look at that. Yeah, obviously, there's some Ohio State receivers doing pretty well in the NFL right now. Michael Thomas leading that. How much do you – use that kind of in real time with the guys that you're recruiting, either this class or guys still out there? I think the biggest thing with that is a lot of guys really aren't fans of teams anymore. It's more of players. And obviously, Mike is the best in the NFL. And uh, a lot of the guys that uh, like Ohio State or maybe are even coming here uh, like Mike Thomas. So to have that conversation about him being around and, 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 and talk about you know, communication we've had, uh, it's always good, but I don't honestly over, oversell anything like that. I think that it's a track record. I don't think it's just, you know, Mike. I think it's before Mike, you know, from the Chris Carters on. And I think a lot of that has to do with the competition we have at practice and the consistency with that. Uh, but um, obviously it's a conversation. It's always a good talking piece, and especially when uh, the best one in the NFL is one of your own. Uh, it's a pretty easy conversation. So definitely helps, but I wouldn't say I overkill that by any means. Hey, Brian. Um, Jackson. Smith and the Jigbo was um, 
a little bit late to the party in terms of getting up here in the recruiting rankings, and you were on him like more than a year ago. What did you see from him early on that made you love him so much? And you know, how far in advance into the future are you breaking down film for guys like that who are out of state? You know, so I can be one of the first on the scene there. Yeah, I think Jacks. Uh, there's kind of a, a lot of things in play. Uh, one, again. Mark Pantoni and his staff have done a great job helping identify guys and, hey, coach, take a look at this guy. And, and then really it started from there, right? And then once you start talking to a young man, um, you know, it's – I don't want to use the, say it the wrong way, but you find a guy that has the right mental makeup and then you're like, okay, well, what can he do athletically? He's like, well, everything. It's like, okay, so what can he do at some point? You know, you kind of get to that conversation almost like a scout, I think. And then – you know, again, I, we started talking to the young man and his family and how great they were, and, and uh, you know, they, they came to uh, some games early on, so that relationship started to form. You know, in the end, again, when you guys, when we talk about guys, it's just about, hey, this is an opportunity. We think you're a really good player. We'd love for you to be here. And then you kind of take it from there. I mean, it wasn't like we're necessarily mad scientists. He's done a phenomenal job, and his head coach has done a phenomenal job. And, and Rockwall, the uh, – uh, the program down there is amazing. I think it mimics a lot of what we do here. And, and uh, I think that, again, um, it's kind of hard to say, oh, you know, he kind of took off and all the ratings things and all that. In the end, you know, he's a really good football player. He had a great mental makeup. We fell in love with the family. They fell in love with us. And it was really he was our first commit. So uh, in the receiver room, I think it was just a match made that was supposed to happen. Uh, we're glad it worked out the way it did. He's developed into a great player. And now he has to take another step once he gets here. But uh, I'm just really proud of him as a person and all of the turmoil he kind of had being down there and, and then leaving that state and coming up here and the local schools. And there's a lot that went into that. And I think that, you know, their loyalty and how uh, great they've been through the whole process is just uh, epitomizes the whole entire uh, recruiting process. And, I, again, I can't say enough about them. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's doing a great job. We thought he might. But, again, he's developed so well. And I can't wait for him to be here. Ryan, when you look at the receivers you're bringing in, you got guys from all over the country, right? When you go into a place to recruit somebody who lives in Texas, I'm assuming part of the discussion and the thought process is how hard is it going to get be to get this guy out of the state? Were you surprised at all at the beginning of your recruitment about how little Texas was in on him at the time? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, we just kind of focus on our own. You know, we just focus on what, you know, how we want to communicate about our program. We don't really worry about the other programs. Uh, we put ourselves at a very high level. And we hold ourselves there. And, uh, and frankly, we feel like there's only a couple of programs probably in the country that you, we kind of rival, you know, and, we, and we're proud of that. We're not, you know, boasting. So we really wasn't, we weren't overly worried about uh, who's in the area, who else maybe is recruiting you. It was more like, hey, when we get there, we'll have that conversation. But right now, this is, what, this is Ohio State. This is what we have to offer. And we kind of just took it from there. I didn't really, we didn't really think about, you know, how hard or what's the, any of that. We just kind of played it by ear. And again, in the end, uh, if we want to go after some of the best, both young men and uh, players in the country, we expect, you know, to be competing against some of the best programs. So um, no, no real thought to it, but kind of expected. This was your uh, first cycle with Ryan as the head coach. How did he handle the whole thing? I mean, it's, it's a lot for one person to go through. What were your impressions of how he did in his first full cycle? Oh, Coach Day's. Awesome. I mean, it's uh, he's a stud. I think that, you know, a guy that, you know, we, we do a lot as, as position coaches, uh, but for a guy that you know can always come to. And, and if you really kind of get into, into an issue, you can bring it to him. He loves he'll help, love to help you out. And plus, the amount of communication he has with the uh, with the uh, young with the recruits is, um, you know, paramount. It's huge. And you can tell he bleeds this program. He believes the uh, bleeds the culture. And he makes sure that it's not just uh, a bunch of position coaches recruiting these guys. He's recruiting them. Uh, so to have a guy like that uh, to work with, um, you're really on your own. And uh, I can't say enough about the uh, uh, availability he has when it comes to recruiting. Can you just kind of give a, a brief thumbnail sketch or whatever of, of their skill sets of, of your guys? Uh, sure. Uh, so we've got four receivers. Uh, Start with uh, Jax. Jax is down in Texas. Uh, I think he's a guy that, um, again, like going through a what, you know, you always start kind of the, the negative, not to be in a bad way, but maybe that's the NFL approach I kind of had is that, you know, what can he do? Where is his weaknesses? And he's just one of those guys that's really hard to maybe find. You know, I think that, uh, you know, he runs really, he plays great competition. He runs great routes. He's pretty, he's a smart guy. He, uh, uh, I think he understands the offense. You don't really know until you get your hands on him. 
Uh, they, he feels really coachable. You know, again, there's a lot of unknowns at that part of it. But uh, he's a playmaker. Uh, he plays at a different speed. He's got a lot of good twitch. I think he tracks the ball really well. I think one thing you'll notice about these guys, they're all elite pass catchers. They really do well tracking the football. And I think that uh, uh, that's paramount when it comes to receiver play. And Jax epitomizes that. Uh, I would say Mookie Cooper, Terion Cooper, uh, is uh, out in St. Louis, from St. Louis. Uh, a uh, smaller guy, but really stocky. You know, he'll, when he goes to block, he tries to knock you out. I mean, that's one of the biggest things I loved about him. Uh, he, uh, um, you know, can, you know, some speed sweeps to plays down the field. Again, he does a lot. I think that, you know, again, just playing a little more running back maybe than receiver at times. Um, there might be a transition there. But overall, I think, again, sitting out his senior year will be more to find out. But I think he's got the skill sets through the, through the roof. He's very uh, twitched up, very quick. Uh, is pretty straight line fast, too. And again, I think he tracks the ball really well. Uh, but he's going to you know, provide mismatches, and, and I think that uh, I'm thrilled to be having him. He, does, he has a skill set maybe in our room that we don't have a ton of, and uh, it'll add to that. Uh, so those two guys, then you've got uh, G. Scott Jr. out from Seattle. Uh, he is a bigger body guy, man. He's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, runs pretty well, you know, big and physical, again, a great blocker, uh, does a great job in the run game. I would say that he tracks the ball, he swallows the ball, he's got huge hands, and, and every time there's a high point, I feel like he goes and gets that ball. So a uh, great jump ball guy, again, really, I think pretty polished, you know, has a good, pretty good top ends. Uh, you know, one, you'll, and he'll tell you, too, the one thing will be getting with Coach Mick and, and, uh, and, and working his tail off, seeing how fast he could potentially get. And, and at that point, I don't know, again, I don't know what he can't do, you know. So he'll keep working on that. But it, again, I think he's a really smart player. But, um, again, with all these guys, there's so much potential, just like anywhere in college. You know, it's, it's all about between the ears. How can you handle adversity? How can you, uh, you know, learn the offense? How fast can you learn the offense? So that's, that's all an unknown. And lastly, Julian Fleming uh, from PA, uh, you know, again, he's 6'2", runs really well, uh, really fast, ran track as well, um, really great ball skills, very physical in the run game. You know, what's great about Julian is, is he runs in a, you know, kind of a, a wing T offense, a heavy run offense. So the expectations on targets should be pretty low. You know, so when he gets here, hopefully he's not like, hey, man, I need the ball, you know, because he didn't get it a whole lot in high school too. So – uh, with that being said, he get like three targets, it'd be three touchdowns and whatever else. But so that's good. Uh, so I expect a, a great blocker. He sends me all his blocking film before he sends me any kind of catch. He loves it. So hopefully that'll be brought here. Uh, but I think, you know, from a, a route running standpoint, he'd probably tell you that he hasn't had a lot of exposure to running routes and being, you know, exact and detailed on top ends and how to do all that. So the development as a receiver will happen. Uh, but again, these guys, what I can't, speak enough about is you know how uh you know coachable they they come off and how how, how dire need they want to be great and how they talk about you know contributing to the room and and that's where that's where I fall in love and again I think I you know fortunately so far I haven't uh really got to know guys really deeply and then a guy not come per se so you know I know one day that day is going to happen it's going to crush me I really you know dive into the relationships and I really enjoy coaching young men whether it's here or other, I still have people from other schools that I've recruited that didn't come here that still try to text me. I know I can't, but, you know, so I try to create great relationships with these guys, and that's really my sole purpose. So uh, I think we've done that, you know, on a two-way road. So I can't wait to have these guys in the room and, and add to what we have here with some phenomenal talent already in the room. And uh, I can't say enough, though, again, about those kids, their parents, uh, how they were raised, and, and what they want out of this program as much as anything else. So. Right next door, Tim. Yeah, Brian, playing off of that, you know, you're recognized nationally as one of the great recruiters out there right now. Uh, what is it that you like about it? Or, or I mean, and, and then has it come naturally almost to you? So this recruiting, like, recruiter, like, yeah. term just rubs me, like, the wrong way all the time. Like, I feel like, you know, to me, again, I'm just, you know, it's not a business. Like these are like young men that just want to figure out where they're going to go to school and they're trying to find a coach that they can relate to and a program they understand the culture and, and that's all it is. I mean, what are we talking about? Like it's Ohio State. Like this is the best program in the country. So all you just got to do is talk about it. And I think if I talk about it, I could probably detail my drive into work every day. And when I see the baseball field and I can see the track and I can see shots in the over, I mean, it's, this place is amazing. So 
I just try to communicate that as clearly as possible. I try, hopefully, you know, my passion comes through for why I like coaching and, and why I like, you know, the receiver play and the art form and how much I love it. But, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, it's Coach Pantone, it's Coach Day. It's all, it's, it's not me. I'm just, I guess I get the, the headline, but I, I just, you know, I feel like the puppet, you know. So, you know, I, again, I don't know how to really answer that question. I don't, I don't, it's not a one-person job. There's a bunch of people that go involved in this. And let alone the parents. I mean, the parents, it's hard to recruit a young man if he can't come to your school. So the, the, the sacrifices they make to uh, have them come up here and then the communication and, and then the head coaches involved, the different schools, there's so much that goes into it. It's just not one person. Now, uh, do, I enjoy, do I enjoy the recruiting tag? No, I do not. But what I do enjoy, I do enjoy being able to find young men that want to be coached the position and try to reach an ultimate goal they've dreamt about since they were – five years old. That's cool. That's cool. So um, obviously you want to build a room that they complement each other and do different things. But in the end, my job is to make sure they are surrounded by talent. I mean, coaching is great. And I agree with that. If we make a large impact, but there's no better impact than peer to peer impact. So this young man's only going to be as good as he has to be to play at Ohio State. And when he's starting, at what point are you getting pushed? I mean, yes, I can still keep barking at you. But when you see your peer maybe outworking you or doing this better or whatever else, it makes you better. And that's the biggest thing. That was the biggest impact that San Antonio Holmes and Ted Ginn and, and so on and so forth all had an impact on me, Anthony Gonzalez, and they're all first-rounders. So it's like that's the environment we want to create along with the phenomenal culture with Coach Day. So all of the four of these young men, uh, you know, relish in that, love that. We have two quarterbacks. I mean, that's unheard of that, want to, you know, are willing to compete. I feel the same way about the receivers. These are phenomenal receivers that would go anywhere else in the country and probably be, you know, maybe the guy or whatever. But in the end, they want to be together. They want to learn together. They want to push each other. And that's just phenomenal. So when you're, when you're on the trail, are you, are you looking for three, four different kinds of receivers now? I mean, you're, you know, you're the wide receivers coach, but that, there's three or four positions in there when you when you look at it. I mean, I mean how, how do you do you try to fill a quota every? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's always a numbers game, you know, and there's always a who could leave game and maybe maybe a skill set a little bit. Like I said, though, I like guys that can basically do everything, right? And I think that um, and Coach Day and everyone kind of agree. You know, we have the same conversations and. Uh, but quota, I mean, what, it's based on, you know, scholarships and who might leave and who might not and, and all those things. So uh, it's kind of complex. But however many are kind of leaving is usually how many you're trying to bring in. So you're kind of handicapped sometimes. And, but uh, in the end, you know, I like to make sure that um, I'm also meeting great young men that are, great, you know, DBs. That affects my room. And I want to bring great young guys like that in. And so it's not just always receivers. And one of the quickie, K.J. Hill, what is his legacy beyond the record, beyond the possible next record he's going to set? Uh, next week, but what's his legacy to this room? You know, I think it's it's really unselfish. You know, again, he's a guy that could have left early. He came back, um, and he was a staple. I mean, if you pull K.J. Hill out of our room, we are not as talented in that room, and that says a lot about him. That says a lot about his family. That says a lot about the belief he had in Coach Day and, and the uh, program and where it was going. I went through a head coaching transition, and he's just steadfast, and he was ready to rock, and so it says a lot, uh, you know, the plays he's made throughout his career are phenomenal. But I think his biggest legacy, hopefully, will be how the young guys turn out. You know, the, the guys that you leave behind and how you leave the room is your true legacy. You know, so the impact that Terry McLaurin and Paris Campbell and Johnny Dixon had is being shown right now. And then, you know, how these young guys now progress, both as individuals and as full players, that's KJ's legacy. That's Austin Mack's legacy. So uh, that's Ben Vick's legacy. That's C.J. Sumner's legacy. So... Again, four guys are leaving. Four guys are going to need to step up. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see these guys progress uh, come next year with these guys gone. And, and they have a great platform, like we talked about. They have four guys coming in that are going to be here in January that don't know right from wrong. So it's really hard to see, uh, you know, what maybe Paris Campbell or Terry uh, McLaurin or uh, Johnny Dixon did when you haven't been in the room with them. So they're going to see what you do. Now, are you going to carry what KJ and how they practice in Austin and Ben and CJ? Or are you going to create a new standard that uh, makes it a lot more difficult to hold? So that'll be the legacy uh, of KJ and the rest of the guys. Brian, a couple times this year I'd check Twitter on a Friday night and see Jackson with like 200 yards receiving and five touchdowns in the first half. When you see that, like what goes through your mind? First, I laugh. And I'm like, gosh, I wanted like two catches when I was in high school. Secondly, uh, you know, it goes through my mind. I'm like, dang, he's pretty good. That's probably second. 
And then I always make sure they won, right? So that's the next one. But, uh, you know, I guess uh, pretty profound. I mean, the, the, the career he's had in Texas, I mean, that's a great football state, call spade a spade, you know. And, and uh, for him to be amongst the best, you know, of all time is just astounding, you know. And I think that, uh, you know, it, another thing that jumps off, too, is on his Twitter, you see how good of a teammate he is. You know, he does always talk about his O-line and people around him, and, and that's really who he is. He radiates that, which is phenomenal, you know. And I think that's awesome. But, no, he's a really good, very productive player. And then and then inverse of Julian, I'm like, oh, man, he's never going to see that many catches here in one game. You know, so it's like I hope he can lower his standards. You know, no, I'm kidding. But, like, in the end, uh, you know, it's just, it's just great to see the guys have success. You know, I mean, in the end, when you're a young athlete, and you start getting talked about a lot, and the, the the pressures these guys deal with that most guys didn't have to deal with ten years ago, and never to deal with the access these uh, adults and other kids have to these athletes before they're probably even ready. You know, it, frankly, these young men are probably more versed with Twitter and social media than their parents. Their parents can't even comprehend what's going on and, and how to handle it and how to tweet the right way and, and how to have a message. So to see him carry himself the right way, that's the most impressive. And I would say that. You know, in the end, um, you know, the, the stats are what they are. When he has opportunity, he makes plays. But really, as a person, that's really what astounds me and how he's able to, you know, go through the hoops there uh, with that and handle that the right way. So um, can't say enough about him and his family and how he's been raised. A couple more uh, front row left, Doug. You guys have had unbelievable success with Paris and KJ in the slot in your time here. But there's some smaller slot guys in the Big Ten, Rondale Moore and KJ Hamler and guys like that. With Mookie, did, like, were you interested in that? You talked a little bit about a different skill set a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, he's just a smaller slot guy. Were, were you intrigued to bring in a guy like that? No, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah, where's my short guy at? I wasn't, I wasn't looking for that. I love short guy. Yeah, I wasn't like doing that. Guy. But, you know, to me, you know, you know I'm, I'm big on, you know, to me, I always think, like, I don't care. Like, so he's, his eyes are this height versus that height. Like, I don't know if that changes. It's more about, like, your range, of your catch range. Like, are you explosive to get off the ground? Does it matter if you're 5'11"? If you can jump out of the gym, then it doesn't matter if I was 6'4 and can't jump. So, uh, to me, I think that you do want different guys with skill sets. You're looking for guys that are explosive. Looking for guys, again, culturally, they fit here first, you know. And, and then you go about uh, – um, you know, maybe if you do do a speed sweep, you know, some guys are maybe built more for that. Maybe he has a little more running back background, so it's better for him to carry the, the football. And, and how physical is he? Is he willing to block? There's a lot more that goes into it than just, you know, I want to look alike. That's not, that's not it at all. It's just uh, skill set, different, you know, and I think that, you know, his return uh, capabilities are phenomenal. So there's just more of a skill set than it is height and weight and everything else too. But with that being said, I mean, you know, if you're going to be – you know, 5'10", in our opinion, in our offense, you got to be able to block. So to be 170 pounds, that doesn't usually work out right, you know, because it's hard to go walk, you know, be in the slot and block a walkout backer, you know, in the run game. But then also you want to catch a go ball. Like, they have to marry up. But frankly, we ask these guys to do a lot of things, but you got to do it both. We can't just sub for a pass play, and then on a run play we put someone else in there. So you got to make sure that, uh, again, that's a lot of it through the years, you know, between the years is, is you have the mindset to go in there and block a, a Sam backer. And then is he fast enough to go catch a ball? That skill set's pretty hard to find, believe it or not. And we've done a pretty darn good job of finding it over the years. And we got to continue to do that. But that's a, that's a rare, rare skill set. What's the situation with him when you have a guy like that who, who has a situation like Mookie did this year? Mm -hmm. How do you talk to him during the season? Because you don't. Yeah, I think it's, and what do you have to do to coach him up when he gets it's here? It's a little different because he wasn't injured. But, I mean, you've had injured guys come back, you know, and I think that, you know, if anything, he's taking less hits on the body. He's even fresher. So I'm good. Uh, but, you know, for Mook, it was hard for him because football is his life, and uh, he's always done it since he was young, had to change school. So there's a lot of transition there, new friends, new – so there was a lot of communication there helping him and, uh, and, and talking with mom and everybody too. But, again, he's a fighter. He's tough. And uh, uh, he handled it. it. Was there bad days? Of, uh, of course. But I think that in the end, uh, the communication was excellent. And uh, uh, he's a stud. You know, he's got a lot to learn. And he's going to continue to grow up. But he's, he's, he's awesome. So. Last question. Uh, <coughs> um, with as young as you are, and you know, as and as successful as you've been, if I were a receiver coming into this program, I would wonder when you would get a chance to be more than a position coach. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that is something that comes up in recruiting your personal future and, and how you address it if it does. Uh, yeah, I address it. I think that, 
you know, for me, uh, college football is a crazy, crazy world. And uh, it's only getting crazier. I think that, you know, it all comes back down to purpose, in my opinion, and nothing on any one of their coaches out there. You know, I have a strong uh, passion for Ohio State um, to, from two hours from here. My wife's from Columbus. Uh, her family's here. My, you know, my family's only two hours away. I think that uh, I have friends that are all here from high school that live here. It, it's, I'm very passionate about Ohio State. I think, you know, at this point it's really early. I don't want to sound ignorant to the fact, but, you know, it's, it's, I don't know what would get me out of the city, frankly, I mean, unless I'm just not good. So um, hopefully I can control that and keep getting better, you know, but I think that my passion is, lies in this receiver room. I love coaching the wide receivers, and there's a lot of coaches that say they'll never leave. And, uh, you know, I, never is a long time. But, again, being honest real, realistically, I just don't, I don't see a situation where, you know, you know, hopefully I'm out of here anytime soon. Hopefully I'm here for a long time. Again, I've earned it year in and year out. It's not given to anybody. But uh, um, I have, I, right currently I have no uh, desire to – go there or go here or do I just don't I love being here I love talking to you guys and uh it's very natural and easy to just you know shoot it from the heart and not so I prefer to live in that world and I'll you know be here as long as hopefully they'll have me so thank you coach yep yep thanks